Well, hello and welcome to this episode of the Family Business Podcast. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined today by Jeremy Miller, who is the founder of Sticky Branding. Firstly, Jeremy, thank you for joining us on the show today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Russ. No worries. And we are speaking to you in, I'm in the UK, you're based in Canada. We're in the Mm -hmm. middle of a global pandemic. How are things for um, you over there? Well, we are still, as of today, May 29th, we are still in a state of lockdown in the Toronto area where I am based. Um, we have been locked down now going on 11 weeks, and we're starting to see those uh, the, the re- reemergence of things. If you look outside, it's spring, we see the blossoms, there's that vitality, and I think that same feeling is starting to come back into, at least where we are, where the uh, social distancing and stay at home orders are starting to be lifted a little. Uh, companies are coming back online. It's warm out, so we want to be outside. So I think there's a sense of hope. I, I think uh, it's been a rough few weeks, but uh, I think uh, hopefully we're, we're coming through onto a positive other side. Yeah, let's hope so. And I think we're going to cover some of the, um, the opportunities that lie um, out there for, for family businesses a bit later in the show. But before we get into all of that, Perhaps you could give um, the audience a a bit of an intro into you, um, how you came to be doing what you're doing um, now. Sure. Well, I think this is an interesting question that we all face is how do you describe yourself after coronavirus? And I think we all have this BC, AC moment. I could tell you the whole story of how I'm an author and a speaker and a consultant and what we did before coronavirus, but let me just tailor it to today because uh, I had a very visceral reaction to what happened with the coronavirus and the lockdowns. I grew up in a family business in the recruiting sector and we would go up and down with the economy. And uh, when this crisis started, I immediately saw at the beginning of March that we were being thrown into a recession and all of my programming kicked in. And so today what Sticky Branding does is we work with business owners and their teams to help them first uh, recover the customers and revenue taken by COVID-19. And then once we get to a stability side of things, we're really working on slingshot strategies. How do you slingshot your business out of this crisis so that you come out of it stronger than ever? So fundamentally what Sticky Branding is, is we're a strategy consulting firm that has truly embraced the current climate of where we're at. And we call this crisis marketing. Mm -hmm. And I find it very purpose-driven work just to, to help companies navigate this very complex situation. Yeah. Um, and as we've mentioned, we, we are emerging into this kind of new world and it's not something where we've really had something similar. I know we, we've spoken off air about uh, the sort of recovery following World War II and it's not, mm-hmm. it's not quite the same situation because it's, th- this is a, a global pandemic that has affected lots yeah. of um, people all over the world. But there are sort of the green shoots that, that we're seeing in, in a literal sense f- from the time of year that it is um, f- for us both, um, but also in terms of opportunity for um, businesses moving forward. And it, that, that's presumably something you're seeing in your own work as well. Yes. So I would make two comments on this. The first one is uh, that this is a very fluid situation. What I uh, have found so stimulating on this is that the strategy models that we are applying and developing are evolving in real time. And, uh, and so we are, are, what I've seen happening within our clients and in my own practice is just an acceleration of learning development and application. Uh, I would, there was a, there's this thinking that, that the coronavirus or COVID-19 is an agent of change. And I would argue, no, it's not. It's actually an accelerant. Many of the ideas and plans we had in place before this, it's just accelerated. We're getting products to market, what might have taken a year happening in weeks. We're getting uh, business and total revitalization programs taking place in the matter of days and weeks and months. And so everything is so accelerated right now. And But that also ties back to this idea of green shoots. Every single crisis, whether it's an economic crisis, a natural disaster, a health crisis like today, creates change. So new needs, the things that we are experiencing today, today we're having Zoom webinars and virtual conferences and work from home and and on all of these different situations. Well, those are all new needs. But the thing that's interesting is many of the new needs that are established today become tomorrow's markets. 
Uh -huh. And and so and that and so I'll give you a very brief example. In the 2002 2003 SARS pandemic in China, it caused millions of people to stay at home and have social distancing type restrictions like we're having today. And so as a result, they embraced e-commerce a decade before the rest of the world. Uh -huh. And that caused the rise of giants like Alibaba. So that's an example of what happens. But What's so interesting right now is this goes well beyond e-commerce and curbside pickup and, and Zoom meetings. Every sector has green shoots of opportunity. Uh, in Canada, for example, I'll give you a very random example. Uh, construction workers have been walking off job sites because they think the facilities are unhygienic. So a wow, porta potty okay. at the best of time is gross. Like nobody wants yeah. to hang out there. That's not a comfortable place. But today it's actually deadly. The CDC uh, has said that COVID can be transmitted and distributed in human waste. Right. And so the construction workers, rightfully so, concerned for their safety, are if they're not clean, are not going to go. So they, they won't go on the job site. So they're anticipating and they're requesting that uh, the, the facilities be cleaned three to five times a day. Beforehand, that might have been once or twice a week. Mm. So imagine the ripple effect that creates. That goes from everywhere from uh, the, the service companies have to be putting more trucks on the road. They have to be running them more frequently, which means they need more, more hiring, which means they're using more parts, which means they're calling their distributors more frequently than the manufacturers are being activated. And the whole supply chain is coming online with this one green shoot of construction workers want to poop and not get sick. Yeah. <laughs> it is incredible, the, the knock-on effect and the change in behavior that we're going to see uh, for consumers uh, and the impact that that's going to have on established businesses and, and the, uh, the point you made there that I think I, I've seen um, most during all of this is the acceleration of the, the potential for new markets beyond COVID because there was lots of talk before we even sort of knew that the, the pandemic was was on the horizon of people spending more time working away from their offices and spending more time in virtual meetings and there was sort of I, I heard of a story of a an IT project where uh, they'd set the, the time frame as nine months to deliver this online um, sort of meeting facility. COVID hit, they had to shut their offices and the project was finalized and delivered within six days. And so again, it just highlights the acceleration that can happen as a result of the need to do this. And because our behaviors as consumers will be changing as we emerge from this crisis, Presumably, businesses will need to adapt their own strategies, perhaps adapt their own branding and messaging in order to uh, be applicable when we emerge from this crisis. Is that right? Absolutely. So we have this acceleration issue, which I think has created the greatest entrepreneurial opportunity of our lifetime, we have multiple generations. This is one of the greatest moments. But within this, there's so much complexity because this isn't an economic crisis, this is a health crisis. And if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's like we've been smushed down the entire triangle and we're fearful. We, our safety concerns related to our health, our homes, our jobs, our wealth have all been put on the line. And that psychological switch is, is, is breaking so much of our marketing. And you see this because many brands are coming across as tone deaf or opportunistic or worse, they're just gross and icky. And, uh, and so there's then created a fear from marketers and companies that they don't want to market. They don't want to sell, even though they have to. You've got to sell right now. This is the only way you're going to survive. But there's this fear of sales because you don't want to come across as opportunistic and icky which means you have to change your value proposition and your approach in order to navigate this thing well. And one of the um, many benefits that come from um, traditionally family owned businesses is their ability to adapt, their ability to not have to go via 15 different committees and then onto shareholders to, to get approvals and that they're able to call much more on their own sort of value set uh, as a, a part of their um, strategy. And again, I'm guessing from, from my slightly uneducated um, viewpoint that articulating that in a, a business's brand or their strategy and, and what they're looking to do beyond COVID would, 
would be beneficial. It's not, it's not going to be a bad thing, is it, to, to be based on family values that are um, you know, more aligned to the consumer than they are to, to maybe shareholders. Oh, absolutely. Again, this is this, this accelerant thing. So uh, the first is family businesses before coronavirus had a competitive advantage because customers and consumers trusted family businesses more. If you had a known family that was connected to the community, that was a more trustworthy company than, say, a conglomerate or that faceless brand. You want to, who do you want to work with? Even if it was a, a large global family business, it was even more trusted than their direct competitors. And that was uh, proven in several studies. Uh, the most famous one was with uh, the Kennesaw School of Management and Ernst & Young that, uh, that profiled 1,500 uh, family companies to, to get to that. So that was pre-COVID. That is even more true today. But there's a, a second layer that I would put onto this. The, the, the most effective way for any business not to be perceived as opportunistic or icky is by being helpful. What we have is this shared experience. Every company, every person from around the world is going through the exact same thing at the exact same time. And so the question I keep posing to people in, in crisis marketing is, who needs your expertise and capabilities the most right now? And when you look at the horizon, there's all this need, some within your direct customer base and some with, say, adjacent markets or customers. And you could ask that question, how do we be of helpful? And from there, you can identify, well, how do we adapt our products and services to serve that need? And then how do we sell that? And if you focus on that need of generosity and helpfulness, which is all part of your family values, then you will never be perceived as opportunistic and icky. Your marketing will never be perceived as tone deaf. And it will actually create uh, a really strong level of, of engagement. Mm -hmm. and, and we've seen examples, I'm sure it's the same the, the world over, of um, family businesses, other businesses as well, but, but this is the family business podcast. So we'll, we'll champion the family business um, side of things here. Um, but the, the, the ability to adapt to change their manufacturing processes, for example, in, in order to move from making gin to making hand sanitizer so that people are able to, to get their hands um, sort of sanitized at, at, at the right moments. And it's, it's those kind of things where we're seeing those values being lived that is, nobody's seen that as opportunistic because it is no. coming from a place of um, genuinely wanting to help um, to, yeah. to provide that product. And th there's lots of people out there who would, would gladly drink their um, gin or buy their gin as a result of what they've seen from this particular company in making hand sanitizer. So it's not opportunistic. It is doing the right thing, but doing it in the right way. It's a fortuitous circle. Yeah, it, it's a fortuitous circle that as much as you're trying to do the right thing, your customers in this moment in time want to support you. Mm. And this is the piece that I find so interesting. So I'll give you a family business example, actually. Uh, one of my clients is uh, one of Canada's largest ice cream manufacturers. They're called Central Smith. They are a third generation family business. And just, they're just outside the Toronto area. Now in Canada, they are one of the largest food services ice cream manufacturers or frozen dessert manufacturers. But you can imagine just on that statement that uh, they have been adversely impacted because half of their business comes from serving the restaurant trade. Mm. And so uh, at the start of this crisis, they had a, a the, the, the restaurant trade collapses and they uh, have an overstock of product. And two of their young employees, Jillian, who is part of the family and Megan, who's uh, another staff member, got the idea of, well, why don't we offer uh, a Shopify store and curbside pickup? So the two of them uh, got the idea, they, they proved it for management, and they put up a, a Shopify store with, uh, with, the, with six flavors of the overstock uh, ice cream. And then they went to the local chamber of commerce and a few food bloggers and said, can you help us get the word out? Their first week, so this took about a week to put the, the online store and get all that ready. So that's the accelerant side of things. But the first week to get it done, it goes live. Their first week the store is live, it sold more than a standard month in the retail store. Wow. Blown away, right? <laughs> uh, and so they were just, and so they, they expanded it. They put their entire catalog out there and the demand increased. People are actually 
driving up to, they, they do the order online, they'd show up to, to, to do their pickup. They would be putting like two 11 and a half liter tubs of ice cream in the back of their trunk. And these are huge. They're like dumpster uh, or garbage <laughs> pail sizes of ice cream. And, and the, the staff are laughing. They're like, I think the 19 and COVID is going to mean something very different at the end of this thing. <laughs> yeah. And, but the, but the community supports them and they're coming back. And then every week the staff have been innovating. So they got the idea a couple of weeks ago of, well, why don't we offer one liter hand packed tubs? And they said, okay, that's a good experiment. So they didn't think the demand would be much. So they packed 200 uh, tubs. First day they had 1700 orders. Wow. And they, that allowed them to hire another person. So they're actually uh -huh. growing. Uh, yeah. And they continue to do this. And they do this on all sectors. They've actually recovered the, the revenue. In, the ten, in 10 weeks, they recovered the revenue they lost across multiple fronts. And the way they have been doing this is by empowering their team. Uh, mm -hmm. Brett Stevenson, their CEO, said to me uh, a little while ago, he said, we've had this remarkable shift in culture. We went from an and or culture to an and and culture. And uh -huh. he, when I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, and or someone would have this job or that job. I don't do that. That's someone else's thing. They'd have their defined. And you get that bureaucracy in, in old businesses too. But now they have, everyone says, this is my job. And if you want something else to, done, they will do it too. It's that and and mentality. Uh -huh. uh, and so uh, that they, what Jillian Megan did was just a very visible example, but at all levels from safety to manufacturing, to sales, to finance, everyone is activated, and uh, and and what uh, Ian Skates, uh, the the CEO and and family member, told me was, this is fun. He's having so much fun right now. This is what it means to be an entrepreneur. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. And it uh, again is a, a a highlight there of. Um, different uh, generations of that, that same family who are co cooperating t together and, and adapting. Um, and uh, again, one of the opportunities I think that will um, come out of this is the, um, the ability for the next gen to influence the longer term strategy of the family more so um, as a result of this accelerate um, process. Um, again, is that I something so. you're seeing elsewhere? I, I, I think we are seeing early signs of it, but my greatest pet peeve. So my, in my family business, my, uh, my parents had a, a stated goal from before we joined the family business that their job was to create next generation entrepreneurs. Uh -huh. They had no interest in gifting the company to my brother or I. And, uh, and so they thought, they thought their responsibility wasn't to teach us how to run their business. It was to teach us how to build businesses. And, uh, and I, so I, I feel a, a eternally grateful for that because that has guided me ever since and to, to this day. But I think the, the shame that we see is in many family businesses is that doesn't happen. And the next generation are basically raised as caretakers and they become caretakers of the, of the, the previous generation's vision. And mm -hmm. that can be lucrative and that can be beneficial, but today, caretakers are at a substantial disadvantage because even if your company is leading and you're making hand sanitizer and you've got the tiger by the tail, your competitors in that same place do too. And they have this accelerated mindset. So the companies who act first and adapt fastest have the advantage today. And so in every family business, the question is not only within the, the first generation or the current generation, but in the next generation and your staff, how do you drive that entrepreneurial agility and that warrior mindset into all facets of your business? And mm -hmm. you have total permission to do that right now. If someone yeah. says, well, I don't want to do that, you go, it's COVID outside. Let's get going. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and again, in, in terms of um, that uh, uh, caretaker role, um, th there's a saying, I, I may get it slightly wrong because I'm doing it off the top of my head, but it's, um, the most dangerous saying in business is because that's how we've always done things around here. And, and that, that's a slow and painful death for some businesses when there's normal market conditions where it kind of gradually the competition takes over and it falls away. But, but actually now we're seeing this resetting of the landscape because of the COVID-19 situation. And so that kind of attitude of we can't change or adapt because we've never done it before it's going to leave those businesses very, very vulnerable to the world when we come outside of uh, the sort of COVID lockdown that we're, we're facing at the moment. 
I think you're raising a very important succession decision that I think every family needs to have right now because your wealth is at risk. Mm-hmm. And the in the business, all businesses, even if you're successful, all businesses right now are at a state of risk. It's opportunity and risk. As the opportunity increases, your risk increases, right? So one of the, the things that I've been talking with, so I would say two thirds of my clients are family enterprises. And one of the very transparent and difficult conversations we've had, and we, we continue, we bring it up every now and then, but is we have three choices. Every business owner has three choices today. You can exit, you can hibernate, or you can innovate. For some, uh, hibernation has been a thought. So you look at the restaurant industry and just what's happening there. And there's many family businesses in that spectrum, especially restaurant groups. And so you can't operate right now. So what do you do? It's do you exit, do you innovate, do you hibernate? And I think for the first time, exiting is not something I would generally say as a, as a, as an ideal situation, but if your wealth is at risk and the length of recovery is going to force you to basically finance your business, you haven't had to finance for a generation. You have to ask the question, do we take the chips off the table? Maybe that we reallocate that wealth to to the next generation. Maybe we come back later, but taking your chips off the table is a very viable conversation right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't, I really am scared by hibernation. I think that is a a form of uh, like, gophering or turtling, or you put your head down and it'll get better. I don't think it's going to get better. It's, it, you, it's going to be the question of the innovators. So if you need to hunker down, it's really going to be the question of how do you innovate right now at the same rate you would, even if you were, uh, even if you were fully active uh-huh. because the climate is fully changing. The, so the restaurant industry, we're seeing, uh, 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 takeout orders and and all of these types of innovations taking place as well as as, well, as where they open up, but every industry is going through this. So I really I think you got three choices, but really two. Either you're gonna take your chips off the table and do that well, or you're gonna innovate, and that means your next generation really has to define this because you could be looking at a two, three, four, five year. Uh, run rate. And if yeah. you're, uh, if the next generation's in their thirties, that's prime succession zone. Mm-hmm. So they need to be voicing what they want the business to look like after, uh, as they take control, their, their voice now is more important than ever before. Yeah. And a lot of the conversations that I'm having at the moment, particularly around the sort of next gen, um, uh, age category or, or, or positioning in the family business is that they, they are, being or it's being highlighted how important the family business is in their own lives and it's something that perhaps has been in the background for an awful long time and has been taken for granted i don't mean that in a negative sense but it's just never been under the same level of threat that it is now and so it's polarizing that view towards the next gen wanting to become closer and more involved in the next stage for the family business or in some respects they're going actually I don't want to be sort of in charge of this for the next 10 years because it's going to be a really tough 10 years. But I think this has given the opportunity for those conversations to start happening so that the next gen can, can raise it with the senior generation to go, okay, if I am going to be coming into this business and taking it forward and moving it forward, we need to talk about how it is we're going to do that. Because it's yeah. not just a case of, like you say, maintaining the status quo and doing what we've always done before um success if there are is easy is a way to be uh, success the uh, dulls your senses doesn't it absolutely and if there are next gen who are listening to this who are thinking yeah actually that's that's me where should they start in those sort of discussions around strategy because it might be something that has been quite a hardship to turn in in previous um discussions and again they don't necessarily want to come across as opportunistic and go right now's the time you're going to start listening to me well when i answer this from two perspectives let me tell you what i did in my family business and Mm. what happened to me and then i can talk about this from a broader perspective of strategy and we can weave it together so in i went through my succession process in roughly 2007 And we had a family facilitator come in and we were going through that. And he posed to me a question. He said, Jeremy, if your parents gave you a half a million dollars, would you invest it in shares in the business? B, 
being the eldest and, and person working in the business, my brother wasn't in at the time. Uh, I said, yeah, of course, that's what you do. Like I'm the eldest. So I've got to take over for my parents. They need to retire. And he's like, well, that's stupid. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> I'm like, thanks, Tom. Um, <laughs> but he said, no, like that, 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 that's really stupid investing logic. I'm like, okay. He's like, you've just been given a whole whack ton of money. How do you want to invest this? This is your inheritance. Nobody's expecting you to buy shares in the businesses. You can do whatever you want. You can put it in the stock market. You can buy a house. What are you going to do with it? So I took uh, some time and then and thought about it and talked to an advisor. And, and I came back to the family council and said, you know what, mom and dad, um, based on what I'm seeing in the market, I wouldn't buy shares in your company. And in, in the HR recruiting sector, we were being disrupted by technology. When my parents started, an average size firm in the, the Toronto area where I'm based was in that 25 to 35 million in revenue. Uh, at that time, we could see it fracturing. Uh, since about 2000 and oh, I want to say 2015, the average size firm in the Toronto area is less than half a million. And wow. so I looked at the market trends and I could see what dis the disruption was happening. And I said, I don't think this is a good investment decision. And my dad just starts clapping. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, he, he, so he felt relieved because now he didn't have to steward this in. He had direction for me of what I needed. And so what happened was uh, we, that was a, a clarifying moment. I, I felt really guilty. I got to tell you that I was scared out of my mind to say that uh -huh. to my parents. I thought I was letting them down. And they, they were totally pumped. Uh, so what happened was we had a, I had created a Salesforce design consulting practice inside the business. That got spun out to form sticky branding. And then I packaged and sold the business, but I was running two companies for a period of time. I sold the company in 2013. That commission allowed me to write my first book, Sticky Branding, and it allowed me to do what I want to do today, which is work with companies to grow their businesses and brands. Mm -hmm. um, but it was that decision. It was having that frank conversation. And, and I think that's what COVID has given us is, is that accelerant moment that you can broach that conversation with mom and dad and say, all right, I heard this really cool idea. If you gave me a half a million dollars, a half a million pounds, or even a million, whatever that number is, how would I invest it? If you were to say, I want to go all in and invest in the, in the business, that's a very powerful conversation. If you were mm. to say, you know what, I would go and be buying some Tesla stock right now, it's a very different conversation. Mm -hmm. So that is, uh, is a, it, it, but it's about opening that door. The problem we have though in, in a family business is it's an emotional as well as a business conversation. And so often we need that outside facilitation to help navigate the conversation. Uh -huh. And this is where that strategy piece comes in is that the work that I do with families today is when we talk about branding, the, one of the first questions I always ask is, are we branding and building a business strategy for succession or are we doing it for an exit? They're two uh -huh. very different paths. They're two very different investment strategies. They're two very different development strategies. When you talk uh, of the mid market, it's all about developing your leadership capability and your operate your leadership capabilities and your operational capabilities to operate at higher and higher levels. Uh -huh. But if you're exiting, it's a different mindset. And so this succession conversation is something that should never be under the radar. I think Parents need to be openly discussing their wants and needs and children need to be openly discussing their wants and needs. It's just a difficult conversation and we have to be cognizant of that. Yeah. And I think your example is a, a very good example of in your mind. And, and obviously I don't know the details um, behind it, but, but from what you were saying there, it sounds as if you're a bit reluctant to kind of say to your parents, I, I wouldn't put my money in this business right now and their reaction was the opposite to what you expected it to be. And so it's, yeah. it's a lesson that we That's can't terrible. judge what those re reactions are going to be. But, yeah. but there are so many cases of people who are, are feeling trapped within their family business because they don't have those types of conversations. Uh, you know, the, the lessons are there for us to learn to say, have those conversations. If you need to have it in a facilitated way, then do that. Then there's um, professionals out there who can, can help facilitate those conversations. Um, but, but again, what I think we've been brought in to, to 
uh, what's been brought into stark focus with this um, COVID crisis is all of our mortality. Is I, I can't imagine there's anyone that has gone through this thinking, I wonder what would happen if I were to get it, because it is a very scary time to, to be in. And that highlights to me that we have one life. It's not a rehearsal. We can't come back next time and, and make different decisions. Um, and so being really open and honest in those conversations is the best way to um, have those conversations. Yeah, but it's starting the conversation. And that was yeah. the problem before coronavirus. If Tom didn't pose that exercise and that challenge to me, I would probably still be in that business. Mm -hmm. I would still be running it. And to be transparent, I didn't like that business. I never did. I just felt obligated because I want, I loved working with my parents. I, I love the, I love, there's loves, lots of it I love, but I actually did not love that, that industry, that business. It did not play to my passions. And, uh, and so I would have been trapped in being a caretaker to a business if I wasn't forced to confront my mortality and, and what I was willing to do and someone to challenge me. Um, and I think that ca carries on constantly. That's, I mm. don't think I was a unique situation. I think I am very fortunate in what happened. Um, but that takes us back to today. The coronavirus pandemic has created an opportunity to accelerate all of the conversations, to go to have conversations with your management team, your family, your boards, of just look at that triangle. If you drew a triangle on the whiteboard or on a piece of paper, you would exit, hibernate, innovate. Which path do we wanna go on? And what are the ramifications of that? And what does this mean to the family? What does this mean to our wealth? What does this mean to our employees? What does this mean to the community? What does this mean for our investments? Because the reality is this is going to be a tricky, challenging year, not even this year, but potentially into 2021, 2022. Yeah, absolutely. We haven't, dealt with the fundamental issue today is we're still caught on the health crisis and we're being propped up by uh, wage subsidies and funding, but that is masking the underlying recession that has happened. Uh -huh. And so we have to have these business conversations. I think we have roughly a six month window of opportunity to get ahead of this thing, to be moving quickly before it starts slapping back. And so the steps and actions you take today are everything. If you're having that, you know, you need to have that uncomfortable conversation and you're not comfortable with it, talk to an expert. If uh -huh. you can broach it, then have it. Don't. And if somebody says, I don't think that's appropriate right now, just go, it's COVID out and, and just keep going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and presumably most people are in lockdown situations, so they can't make the excuse of, I've got to go here. I've got to be there. I've got to do that. Um, so the, the time is opportune to, to have those um, conversations. Um, just, just as we begin to sort of wrap up the, the conversation, uh, um, uh, again, particularly around um, sort of previous experience and, and what you're seeing in the, the marketplace with your clients at the moment, are there, are there any other examples that you can draw upon that, that the audience could um, take away as, as like an example of um, someone who's been doing it well? Sure. Well, I can, a couple that come to mind. So what I have seen is this is not equal, uh, that there are winners and lo losers like in any recession, but it's very acute today. And so the two extremes there's leading. So if you're selling personal protective equipment or hand sanitizer, you hit the lottery, lottery, or you could be bleeding. If you're in the hospitality or restaurant sector, then it, it's, it's not good. Uh, but in the middle, we've got, so it's leading, stable, slipping, bleedle, bleeding. And most of us are somewhere in the middle. Uh, so we have seen clients, or our clients at Sticky Branding being down anywhere from 30 to 50% on average, uh, with a few that are down as uh, much as 90%, which are in the restaurant and event space. Mm -hmm. But what we have seen is this, uh, this element of, um, of punching back. And uh, so I'll give you uh, an example, actually, uh, of an extreme example that should be way down, but it's not, is uh, Element Fitness, which is one of Canada's largest uh, CrossFit and fitness facilities. Mm -hmm. And you would expect a, a place like that would be decimated in, in this crisis. But let me just give you the stats. So as of about two weeks ago, they have actually grown their revenue. 
after the crisis within the first month, they maintained a 92% member retention rate paying full fee. So $200 a month for, for fitness with a 9.8 net promoter score. So 9.8 out of 10 wow. member satisfaction. And so how did they do that? Well, Alex Sabiri, who is the founder, uh, uh, is a really sharp entrepreneur, and he, 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 he said to his team, uh, first and foremost, how do we recreate what's magic inside of our facilities virtually? So how do we recreate the class experience online? But he did something that was also really powerful from a framing perspective. He said, most fitness and gym facilities think of themselves as a rental service. You buy a membership, you go, you pay your fee, you use your equipment, they leave. He said, we are in the coaching and community business. Uh -huh. And so that gave them power to innovate. So they should be down like their competitors, 95%. They've actually, yeah. they're in the, the leading category. So they did this. So like everyone, they put their programming online and they gave that away for free. That was table stakes to, in their mind. Uh -huh. But where they innovate is they assigned every uh, member a dedicated uh, coach that would do daily check-ins and calls. They did online classes. They, they run surveys constantly and adapt the programming. The initial assumption at the beginning of this was people want to have a short workout at home, get sweaty and get on with your day. Turns out people are really bored being at home. So they want longer, more community oriented things. So they extended their classes to an hour. And then they've also put in all these community things. So every night at 730, they have a different activity. And these are often member led. So they have one member who teaches dance. They have a, a game night, a wine tasting night. And it's like TV programming and prime time. And so all of this has, has opened up uh, a huge opportunity, but you think of it, each of their gyms costs about $300,000 a year in rent uh -huh. and their revenue is increasing without using any of those facilities today. Wow. So this is opened up a market that they see that their revenue, they, they anticipate the gym will be reopened again this summer, uh, but they anticipate that these new online virtual programs, they give them new markets, new reach, new membership, new services, they'll likely double their revenue out of this whole thing. Wow. And, and that's a prime example of innovate in, instead of hibernate, isn't it? In, in that scenario, if they'd chosen a different route and, and thought, actually, we're, there's not much we can do here um, and, and put their head in the sand, it would be a completely different survived. story. Yeah. They Incredible implemented stuff. the first phase of this within 24 hours. And this wow. is the acceleration example. Alex was working on virtual programming before this, but he was just too busy working in the business yeah. uh, before he could do it. So he, they actually had started recording content. They were just going to launch it in 2021. Uh -huh. So they had the, the TV and studio equipment. They'd, all, or they'd already invested in all this stuff. So they activated within day one of the announcements that they were going to be forced closed. Um, and then they have continued to evolve. But there's also the family business values here. He said the number one driver for, for himself was to make sure that he protected his staff. He uh -huh. didn't want to lay off a single person. And so the whole team was activated and brought into this. And, and it's been this constant move. But the ideas were there. It just gave you permission that you run and you run hard. Yeah. And the knock-on effect for that is that the – the customers or clients of that business are going to feel so much more loyalty to that brand than they did before. And will probably return in one of two ways, either to the traditional class in, in the premises as before, or they'll retain yeah. their virtual um, class side of it, depending right. on what suits their new lifestyle and, and, and what have you. And, and so the business are diversifying effectively and protecting that, that revenue. But also the, the staff within that business, the employees are going to feel this huge sense of loyalty because they've shown what an awesome place it is to, to be working and that the yeah. business cares enough about them to say, right, come on, let, let's get on and do this and, and protect everyone's jobs. Yeah. And it gives you permission. This is, this is a common theme that's come out from every organization that we've worked with is they had hypotheses or books that... They had these old customers of the old markets, these old models, but they were addicted to that revenue. They were afraid. They literally couldn't imagine killing it because of the ramifications. Uh -huh. and, and so this has been one of the greatest social experiments because as your core business gets closed and you learn how to operate without it, you actually realize 
your assumptions were wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, in one client, they believed that uh, around $10 million of revenue, which was actually relatively unprofitable, uh, was absolutely dependent. And they were just about to invest in a uh, $20 million manufacturing facility to fuel their growth to keep doing that because they had hit capacity. But what they've, they're starting to see right now is, oh wait, we might not need that market. If we keep going down this other path that we always believed in and liked, we can use our current facilities, make more profit and not have to go buy uh, and build another plant. And you're like, oh, that's interesting. Mm. Yeah, very much so. Uh, and again, I think it's just great examples for our audience to kind of tap into and, and apply to their own um, businesses and uh, just, just conscious in terms of, of our time. But if you could kind of sum up the um, kind of opportunity or, or how you would recommend that family businesses approach these discussions around strategy, um, just as sort of a final takeaway for, for the audience to go this is what I'm going to go and do once I finish listening. Okay. So I have two, uh, two thoughts on this one. Let me give you the, the, the questions and I'll give you an offer. Uh, so what I think the starting point on this is how can you be helpful? So the first question, so three questions, how can you, or who needs your expertise and resources the most right now? Then what products or services can you offer or adapt to fit that need? And then finally, how do you sell your products and services to the people with the most need? And that's this whole idea of green shoots. How do you focus on the areas of need right now? Because right now, today's needs may be tomorrow's markets, but it's also how do you be flexible and agile in your thinking rather than saying, this is what we did before coronavirus. Let's look out to the landscape on looking for green shoots, attacking them and being of immense service and value. And if this appeals to you, we have a, a little worksheet at Sticky Branding called the Green Shoot Worksheet. It's part of the Crisis Marketing Program. So if anyone's interested, just send me an email at jeremy at stickybranding.com and just put Green Shoot Worksheet in the, the subject line so I know what you're asking for, and I'll send it back to you. And it's a simple tool that allows you to look at a market, look at the state of it, identify a need, and then how do you adapt uh, your products and services to fit that need. And you can continue to just do that, that exercise again and again and again throughout this crisis because this is a fluid situation. Today's needs will evolve in June, July, September, January, mm -hmm. etc. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Um, we will put that email address in the show notes as well. Um, so um, if you're not able to write it down, um, head over to the show notes um, later and, and we can uh, we'll pinpoint those. Um, obviously, that's one way of our audience getting in contact with you. Where else can you be found? The easiest way to find me is just Google Sticky Branding. Uh, my website stickybranding.com. I'm on all the social networks at Sticky Branding. And the book, my first book at least, is called Sticky Branding. And that's on Amazon, again, where, where books are sold. The newest book uh, we didn't talk about, but... Uh, we had a great conversation on everything else. It's called Brand New Name. Uh, yeah. And so, anyways, you can uh, just Google Sticky Branding. That's a long-winded yeah. long way of saying how to find me. Brilliant. And um, if you're happy to, I'd love to, to have you on again to talk about the, the subject matters in um, the other book as well, because um, I know we, we had a, an interesting discussion about some of that um, a, a few weeks back, and uh, we've not got around to covering it today, but we, we can do another show if you're, uh, if you're keen um, to cover some of that Any stuff day. as well. Yeah, I'd love to. I, I love all this stuff. A family business at work is my passion. I, I, growing up in a family business has been uh, uh, one of the greatest experiences of my life and, and then working with organizations. And so sharing this is very much passion and purpose driven for me. So I really appreciate the opportunity, Russ. Fantastic. And uh, thank you very much. And we will speak again soon.